Hello everyone, Wesley Campbell here. This is Conversions Podcast, and I am with The Voice. John the Baptist identified himself as The Voice in the wilderness. When I heard this voice, I remember the first time I was in Pasadena. We were doing a conference (coughs) at Harvest Rock Mod Auditorium and we're preaching and the thing is going and everybody's shouting and all of a sudden I hear this sound go, glory! And this voice starts ringing through the hall. I'm going, who is this? What is that voice? And I couldn't believe it, it's Lou Engel. He's standing on the stage. He has his arm outstretched like a wakening rod and he's shouting glory and singing. And I'm just going, and the place is vibrating. He finishes, he gets off, I said, Lou, that was the voice of an angel. Get back up there. And lo and behold, someone else just said that to him like minutes before. Is that correct? Well, actually, actually, you said it. I went down. I thought, I got to get down. It was about 3,000, 2,000 to 3,000 people worshiping the presence of God. I felt led to sing glory. (laughs) And literally, I felt as if it was supernatural. It was. And I thought, I got to get down. What am I doing here? And you came up to me and you said, get up, uh, Lou, get back up there. Angels are singing through you. Wow. So I went back up, started singing it again. Then I thought, I got to get back down. I can't keep doing this. I went down and Rick Wright said, Lou, get back up there. Angels are singing through <laughs> you three times. And it was like that glory was resting on in the early days of the outpouring, the Toronto outpouring there in Pasadena. So that's the first time I heard Lou. And from that point, I was I was like obsessed to get that voice to the world. And sure enough, we recorded Extreme Disciples, Elijah Revolution. It primed the pump for the first call in Washington, D.C. with how many how many people came to that call? They estimate 400,000. <clears throat> Lou got up in the dark of the night and he went to the stadium, to the platform overlooking the Washington DC mall. And there were thousands, tens of thousands in the, in the darkness, in the dew of the morning. 5.30 in the morning, I walk on, it starts at six. Park police said by 6, 6.30, there are already 270,000. They had gathered to a sound. It was amazing. <laughs> They had, and part of the sound, part of the sound is the man's voice you're hearing right now. Louis Ange of Basel, his European name, Lou Engel. There's been, as Mike Bickle would say, another Lou sighting. So you know what? We're going to jump into it. Lou is one of the fathers of the modern day revival prayer movement. He's the father of the call, and uh, he's still banging the ground, still doing it. And we've been friends for so many years, we've got no hair left. But we're still doing it in Jesus' name. So, Lou, start at the beginning. What year were you born? How old are you now? Where were you born? What was your childhood like? Yes. Well, I was born in 1952 in uh, Upland, California. Uh, My mom and dad had come uh, from Kansas. They were farmers. And we, uh, a family of four, I was a twin. I have a twin sister. Uh, uh, born on October 9th, 1952. And um, I was born into a holiness revival uh, community. So there's there's four of you kids? Four kids. And you're what order of the four? I'm the baby. I'm the fourth. You're the twins or the fourth? Yeah, the twins. I Actually, she and I, my twin sister Lucy and Louie, Louie and Lucy, you know, uh, she uh, came out before me. I barely lived. Really? Uh, yeah, I was so uh, weak because I was a twin and so small that they had to keep me in de- for days in a, in what do you call it? An incubator? An incubator kind of deal. Mm. I wasn't getting better. Finally, they said, well, he's not getting better. Just send him home and maybe he'll, he'll uh, recover. And uh, sure enough, then... How, what kind of prayer was going up for you even then? Well, I don't know. I, I just know I, I lived in a community, the Brethren in Christ denomination. <coughs> My forefather, Jacob Engel, founded the denomination. Wow. Eight, generation, uh, eight, uh, eight generations before. I'm the eighth generation of preachers in the Brethren in Christ denomination. 
from which uh, uh, Jacob Engel in the 1700s was saved in the uh, First Great Awakening. Really? And became the leader of the denomination, the Brethren in Christ in America. Wow. My forefather, two generations, three generations back, was Jesse Engel. Before the, him, before no, Jacob. after him, down okay. the line, was the first missionary of the Brethren in Christ to Africa, died in two years of malaria, and uh, they, they built a like a little church there in um, Matopo Hills, Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Hmm. And um, and when he died, they tore down the the door of the of the church there in Africa, made it into a coffin. His wife kissed him five times for the five boys that would never see him again. But three years ago, four years ago, my son Jesse and Josiah did a pilgrimage back to the Matopa Hills where Jesse Engel went and was a first missionary, Brethren in Christ. And there's 35,000 Brethren in Christ there wow. welcoming Jesse, my son, generations after the first So Jesse. he would have been a great grandson. Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> a great story. Amazing. So tell us, <clears throat> even let's go back. Okay, you're... You're eight generations back. They're coming to America. Ulrich and Anna Engel. Okay. Fleeing religious persecution. They what were country? Switzerland. <gasps> Louis Ange of Basel. There it is. They came from Basel. And uh, she she was a radical preacher, as I've read. They put her in jail. She was a radical preacher. See, there's DNA, DNA stuff rolling way wow. back there. They fled religious persecution. Fifty kids were on the ship. I've read it in our history books. A disease swept the ship. One child lived. It was Anna's son, uh, Jacob Engel. The mothers who lost their sons gathered around and said, Surely your son has a great destiny. And Jacob Engel started the, first, uh, started the Brethren in Christ denomination in America. Wow. And that's eight generations back. Eight generations back. And uh, they were like uh, the Mennonite, German brethren, very conservative. But then... In the um, in the uh, t toward the end of the 1800s, the Holiness wildfires begin to sweep. Their family had moved to Kansas, and the Holiness revival fires broke out. People being baptized in the Holy Spirit, even speaking about tongues back then. The brethren in Christ, wow. and uh, they were missionaries. Uh, they became missionaries and revivalists. That's my roots. That's true, and that was the. Late 1800s? Late 1800s. <coughs> okay, so we go fast forward. You're a normal family. You're, what, do they, what do your parents do? My dad is a school teacher. Hmm. My mom's a housewife. Four kids. And we go to the Brethren in Christ Church in Upland, California. And it's the 50s. Yeah, it's the 50s. And it's, uh, I, I, I grew up in revival meetings. Really? Yeah, they, they would have camp meetings. And we would gather for a week, and uh, and the old men, we'd uh, they wash their feet, feet washings, and they'd pull out their hankies. I'll never forget one old dude must have been seventy five. I, I, I thought when I was a kid, I, he must have jumped five feet off the floor, <laughs> dancing in the joy of the Holy Spirit. So they'd get hit by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, they were, and the testimony meetings. <clears throat> Well, they, were, they were just filled with glorious stuff. Of course, they preached hellfire yeah. and brimstone. Now, you would have been, like, as soon as you could remember, three, four, five, yeah, yeah. six, well, seven? Age six. Okay. I'm sitting in one of these camp meeting, uh, revival meetings in the church there in Upland. The man was talking about the hell, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I, 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 I said, Mom, I want to get saved. And we walked out to the car, my twin sister and I prayed to receive Christ. It was a real experience that I had. So you remember that? Oh, as vivid as to as can I go to the altar and then they my mom takes me to the car and I receive Christ. And literally literally for several years I lived with a constant hunger for God. From 6 on. Yeah, for 6 to 10 probably my junior high days, I, I, in some ways, I don't ever remember not hungering for God. Wow. And I, I, I remember the pastor, I would just ask questions all the time. The pastor said, you just ask questions to act big. I, he didn't understand what was going on in my heart, but I was hungry for God. You wanted to know. I want to know God. So you grew up with the fire of God, the feeling of the Holy Spirit, the, the fear of hell, the glory of heaven. Everything. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, we, we would go to these camp meetings and you know, the, the, the thing is, I would get saved every altar call. You oh, know? me too. Every oh, summer I got saved again. Oh my gosh. My friend Joe, Joe, you going up? Yeah, I'm going up. We go to the altar and get saved again. The challenge was this. <laughs> I just never had an assurance of salvation. Right. I lived in a constant through, uh, in a constant struggle with, uh, uh, I remember at age eight, I found a Playboy magazine and a demon spirit got a hold of wow. me. That was the war as soon after I got saved, which was eight years old. So it'd be 1960. Yeah, around there. And uh, that spirit sought to destroy me. Hmm. That, that battle of my soul start to start to, tried to destroy me. And, uh, so I lived in a constant world of guilt, wanting God, not sure I'm saved. And I lived with this battle all my days. I ended up throwing myself into basketball. That was my whole world. I just, uh, I, I, yeah. So you were so conflicted by your guilt. Oh. And yeah. of just feeling like you're ashamed and, and had no strength and struggling with the flesh and all this stuff. And you finally just said, I got to get away from God. I'll go into basketball. Yeah, I didn't say I got to get away from God. I wanted God. But I, it, it was so, I just couldn't, I couldn't get it. And, but I submerged myself in studies. I submerged myself in sports. And that really was my world with this secret guilt always raging inside of me. So describe, describe this uh, uh, going into, you know, sports and everything else. What, what, what did that look like? Well, I was good. I hear you were good. I heard you were a, a champion. Yeah, we went to the California State playoffs, the like quarterfinals, uh, 25 and 4. I was, uh, you know, I was the top of the line, all league, all conference, all state, whatever it was. I, so you went all the way through high school? Yeah, I went all through high school, played basketball. Into college? And I then I went to Messiah College, which was a Brethren in Christ College where my dad had gone to. My older sister had gone to, my brother had gone to, and I went to, and I majored in basketball. <laughs> what position? Uh, I, I was a point guard uh, or a swing guard, uh, depending on what year it was. And uh, How? my fourth year, I almost made All-American. I was 12th out of 10 All-American uh, for uh, National uh, Association of Christian Colleges. Really? In, uh, yeah, I went to Messiah College. So how were your elbows? Oh, I was, I played tough and mean. Oh, you were tough. <laughs> yeah. I heard the opponents would just yell out your name. They would just. Oh, that happened to me on two occasions in high school and in college where I, 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 I would come under an anointing. <laughs> <laughs> like a Samson. No, seriously. I would get in a zone and I would tear teams apart. And in high school, Claremont High School, the whole stand, the, Enemy side would stand up and just start chanting, Ingle socks, Ingle socks. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say this other thing, but they're chanting. And I, I felt as if I were in the arena. <laughs> and the powers of darkness were against were you. Raging. And so in college, I play, we played Lebanon Valley, and um, we were down 32 points at halftime. And I came out of that halftime. And literally, it was like a spirit came over me, like a, a holy rage. And I would be fouling people and going crazy, and the referees wouldn't see it. And we lost by one point. We turned it back. And again, the stands all stood chanting, Eagle sucks. <laughs> I actually believe it was actually a prophetic window wow. to my spiritual calling. Wow. That we would, on the arena of history, we would literally be viewed from the, the realms of principalities and powers. And they would, uh, we would be may, making known the manifold wisdom of God to the principalities and powers. And they were they powerless. Be... <laughs> would you just go through with your elbows and everything? Oh, yeah. Just yeah. running over oh, guys? Oh, I would just bust guys. And I'd get <laughs> under a zone and <laughs> it was I was a wild man. And you were a top scorer? I was, uh, I think uh, I was... Maybe not the team top scorer, but I scored a lot. Good for you. Yeah. So the struggle back and forth, school. So during, during those days, I never stopped being hungry for God, but I had no assurance of salvation. 
And I, I lived with a constant battle, with, as I've talked about earlier. And um, I just, I, 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 there was a gospel team, and I hated them. They bothered me because they were hunt, they were going after God. And every time I think I was, was, would see him, I'm thinking that I'm not. Mm. And I have no assurance of salvation. I'm struggling with pornography, and I am being beat up. And wanting at the same time, I would go out into the woods, just wail. <laughs> Sorry. I would cry to God and I'd pray the sinner's prayer, but I never felt that I got heard. Hmm. But I would just go into the woods and cry to God. But I didn't know that the gospel team put me on a hit list. Really? Yeah. Most wanted and least likely to be saved. Really? They didn't even think you could be saved? Well, that's what they told me years later. I didn't even know this. They prayed for me for three years that really? I would be saved. And I graduated from Christian college. So no one knew that you had this this deep desire for God. It wasn't evident. Yeah, probably wasn't evident. I think the basketball players knew it. And I would try to do the Christian stuff, but it was just empty and confusing. And, and I, I sneaked into the city of Harrisburg and watched the bad movies. And it was, I was tormented. And, uh, but those guys were praying for me. So I graduated from uh, Messiah College, Christian College, 1975. Mm -hmm. And I went home to California. And I walked in to the season of the Jesus movement. Wow. Where in the 70s, everyone was getting saved. It was just profound. And I remember going back there, and this is how I got saved. You want me to talk yeah, about it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and my parents had called me on the phone during my college days, and my dad was crying on the phone. And he says, Lou, my whole life has changed. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He starts crying. And he says, something has happened to me. I'm a different person. He said, school t uh, students come to me now and say, what's different about you? And he says, if you'd like to stay after school, I'll show you. And he would lead them to Christ and tell them about the Holy Spirit. I came back home, and the charismatic movement was going on. The Jesus movement and the charismatic movement were in the denominations. People were speaking in tongues and singing in tongues and being baptized in the Spirit. They invited me to an afterglow meeting. Where? In Upland, California. A missionary to Japan had come back home and he was holding these afterglow Holy Spirit meetings in his living room. And I walk in and the room is like filled with brilliant light and they're singing in the Spirit, singing in tongues. You could see the light? Oh, I don't know if it's natural light. I've been in church all my life. But there was a light shining into my heart like and I, I, I just weep over it. Literally, a hunger for God got a hold of me at that point, and I got desperate to get saved. I, I'd never seen anything. The singing in tongues is what ripped me apart. A song of, of the, in the spirit, and uh, so I asked the leader, the missionary from Japan, Doyle Book, if he'd come over to my house. And I sat and talked with me. I talked with him, and he I said, "I want to receive Christ." I, and he says, "Lou, just ask Jesus to come in your life." I said, I, "I've done it a hundred times, but I've never felt it." And he said, "You may never feel it, but God is not a liar. If he, if you ask him into your heart, he will come in." And uh, so, right there, I prayed with him to receive Christ again. And I say it this way, guess what happened? Nothing. What? <laughs> I felt nothing. But I determined that I was going to believe. This time. This time. I wasn't going to ask my emotions, their opinion on whether I was saved or not. Hmm. And I went into a great spiritual battle for 13 days. And the lies would come into my mind. You're not saved. You don't feel saved. And I would yell back, I'm saved. God says that if any man come unto me, I will no wise cast him out. Bold, I stand at the door. <laughs> if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I would, I would 
resist my emotions. Right. And I would hold on to that word of faith. And for 13 days, I went into this tremendous emotional, spiritual battle. 13 days. 13 days. I still remember it. And and I, on the 13th day, I was in the White House. My yeah. house was a White House. <laughs> <laughs> and I was up in the <coughs> upper room. It was my bedroom. <laughs> I could still remember it as plain as day. I knelt down uh, by my bed. I began to pray. And all I could say, I, all I know is, the love of God was shed abroad in my heart. In instantaneous, I was filled with the love of God. And I knew, see, I had lived for years with, with afraid to get in a car lest I die and go to hell. Hmm. This is where I live constantly. Instantly, the assurance of salvation. Wow. I knew. After 13 I, days. After 13 days, I knew I'd pass from death into life. Instantly, all the guilt and all the shame was gone. I stood up from that bed, ran down the stairs, and started shouting. My dad come running, I'm saved! <laughs> I'm saved! I'm saved! I knew it. Wow. The Bible says, by, th by this you may know no. that you have eternal life. No. I think there's a lot of people that prayed the prayer, but they don't have an assurance. Yeah. God says he wants you to know. By the Spirit. Have, by the Spirit. The Spirit witnesses inside of us yeah. that we are the children of God. We need to have the witness of the Holy Spirit that we are sons of God. Was that the first time you had this strong witness? Absolutely. Wow. I experienced something powerful when I was age six. <clears throat> I lost all of that in one sense. Always had the hunger for God. Never had an assurance of salvation. And in one moment, I knew, and I've never doubted it since, hell is nowhere in my future. Only heaven, because I was born again by the Spirit. Wow. Yeah, it was powerful. I ran down shouting, I'm saved. Immediately, I drove to the, the Christian bookstore. I, got, I bought all the Gospels of John, boxes of Gospels of John. I went into the mall, the stores. Same day? Like the same day, the same next two days, handing out tracts. I had something to evangelize about. Before I hated evangelism, instantly I became an evangelist. Wow. And they kicked me out of the malls. They told me you can't be doing this in the malls. They kicked me out of the malls. And then I went to these these uh, big charismatic meeting gatherings. And they I, I wanted so bad to speak in tongues. And I went up and they just said, now just say this, ba 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 ba. So I was like, ba 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 ba. And nothing happened. But I said, man, I'm going to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit somehow. <laughs> so, so, but I, I, I became just alive. My whole journey. And, and those early days, I'll never forget this. How old were you? I was, uh, I, I was 22. Wow. I just graduated from college. I was 22 years old. I was working at a feed mill. And Where? In Upland, California. He's working at a feed mill. And uh, I remember being in the Brethren in Christ Church one Sunday morning, just caught up with God. And a pastor, the pastor that says, there is someone here today that's being called into full-time ministry. I'd never heard anything like this in my whole life. And it's... <laughs> I'm having, I'm being, having a revival just in this... <laughs> In this, uh, <laughs> and I knew the calling of God was on me, and I wow. stood up near the back row. One of the other young man stood up as well. I don't ever know what happened to him, but I knew it's still vivid in my mind. I was called to preach the gospel. You stood right up. I stood right up in a small church. And I got the calling. That's a pretty big church, probably at that time, probably four or five hundred people. Wow, Brethren Christ Revival Church. And uh, right there, I knew I was called into ministry. I didn't want to do anything else with my life. And that was the beginning of, of, a, of, a, great, uh, of a great journey. You know, I look back, those gospel team guys prayed for me for three years. Mm. But when I got saved, I was back in California. After I came back and got saved, I'd get up early in the morning to spend time with the Lord. It's been my habit. From the beginning, just get up early in the morning, spend time with God. I was in the living room, and my mom walks out out of her bedroom, sits down on the couch, and pulls out her daily bread. You know that devotional, mm -hmm. yeah, every day. And 
She breathed her daily bread. And this morning, she says, she gets up. She stands up. She walks up in front of me, turns and faces me. <sighs> and she says, son, I want to show you what I do every day of my life. She kneels in front of me, begins to pray for her son mm -hmm. and pray for my calling. It's riveted in my mind. A mother's prayer shaped my future. Wow. With eight generations of revival saints, I'm convinced the call was not about me. It's the accumulated prayers of generations. So she prayed for you every day. That's what she told me. She said, I get down on my knees and I pray for my son. And she's kneeling right in front of me. It's, it's still as riveting as today. She's 93 years old, and uh, she still prays for like 40 great-grandchildren. A legacy rolling <laughs> down, just rolling down. Everybody in my family gets saved. It's just that generational roll down that's powerful. She's got 40 great-grandchildren. I think great and great great a great, yeah. uh, I think forty all together. Great uh, wow. grandchildren and great grandchildren. Well, she's got forty with just your family. Well, it's rolling now. <laughs> they're they're rolling now. Wow! I just, I just had my fifth, uh, my 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 fourth. Uh, my son had his fourth, and now t and two on the way. So <coughs> it'll be, I'll have six in a few months. That's awesome. And I tell him, give me thousands of them. Give him thousands, <laughs> thousands of arrows shot Come from on. the. <laughs> So your mother goes, this is what I did for you every day. And she kneels and prays. Yeah, yeah. And what did you feel? Oh, I just, it's, I, 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 I owe a debt that I could never repay. Mm. And um, so you begin to pursue the calling. You know you're called to full-time ministry, whatever that looked. Did you know what it was? Oh, I just knew it was to preach. I, I just knew I was to preach. So how did you start preaching? Well, I, 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 I didn't preach right away, <laughs> but this is what happened. I, all I know is I had this intense desire to go back to Pennsylvania, mm. where I'd come from school. You see, my senior year, and I didn't tell this part, but it's very important. Uh, the awakening of my heart actually began a year before I got saved, where the Bible professor at Masai College, I was in a cafeteria line getting my food. And this man named George Kimber walked up to me in the cafeteria line and says, you mind if I have dinner with you? And I sat down with him. And I don't know what it was about that guy, but my whole being began to start awakening to God. And uh, I didn't really know who he was, but he asked me to be a part of his devotional classics course. Devotional classics. Yeah. I, I, I begin to write a journal, you know. Uh, uh, and I was so lost, I'd write poems and swear in them. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I took my answers to the Pope. Did it help me? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> I was very confused, but I was writing this journal, and we all had to do devotional devotions, a five-minute devotional. And I got up for my part and I said, how do I give a devotional about a God I don't know? And I sat down. Wow. And George Kimber, rather than giving me an F, put his arms around me and said, thank you for being so real and honest. Uh, he awakened something in me. I went, got saved, left college, got saved. I was drawn. It was almost irresistible. My parents were saying, don't go back to Pennsylvania. Stay here in California. But I, I, I was drunk. I knew I had to go as the voice of the Lord. Went back to Pennsylvania. <sighs> I, I got a job for trying to help people get jobs. I just didn't have a clue what I was doing. <laughs> so, so, you know, they told me I couldn't witness to anybody and they, it was a government program or something. But I remember g getting up in the morning. I didn't know, I didn't understand the Bible. It just didn't help me. But I just decided I was going to get up every morning at 6 and pray for an hour. I didn't know what to do, so I just prayed for people to get saved. You know? <laughs> so I just witnessed, and I might have even gotten fired. I don't know. But what happened was they told me, someone told me, there's this revival on the edge of town called Dillsburg Brethren in Christ Church in a place called Dillsburg. <laughs> 
They said all the students were leaving the big church on the campus and going out into the woods to a little country church on the edge of town. <laughs> That's a song. It is. That's Chuck Smith. It, yeah. Or Chuck, uh, Chuck. Uh, <clears throat> little country that's it. Was that the song? <clears throat> yeah, well, that's how I call it because it was a little church on the edge of town. In Chuck Gerard. Chuck Gerard, love song. I walk into that building late. It's jam-packed with people. I step into a revival. The presence of God is there. And who's leading it? George Kimber. Really? I find out, I literally, the hunger for God became so intense. I lived in a trailer court out in the woods. And I listened to the Jesus movement for hours. And the love sickness was so intense, I couldn't even hardly contain it. I had to almost begin to cry out to God, stop it, I can't bear it anymore. Your, your passion and love for God was so intense. I felt his love <laughs> and his longing. I was, I've, I've never known anything quite like it. So intense. And I wanted to go to this church, and they gave me the keys because I wouldn't leave. And I would weep for hours. At the, <laughs> At the altar, so, because God was there. Revival, it was just revival. And I remember one night, George Kimber, was a Sunday night or something, and he said, he's a secret Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. Just wait. He, he, he's, he's a secret Pentecostal. He went to a Pentecostal Bible school and you, you couldn't graduate unless you spoke in tongues. And he had never spoken in tongues at his graduation. And they were going down the line praying for everybody. And he had to speak in tongues or he wouldn't graduate. And they were all being slain in the spirit to George Kimber. And they're getting four people down from him. And he says, I'm not going down. I'm not going to let anybody push me. Stuck in his heels. This is your teacher. This is the pastor of the church yeah. who awakened me. Yeah. And uh, uh, he said, the next thing I knew, the guys praying for people were four people down the road, and I'm on my back speaking in tongues. He didn't even know what happened. He didn't even know. He got blasted by the Spirit. And that night he said, I can't hold it back anymore. I've never done this here, and I've never told you. But tonight, I've got to do it. He begins speaking in tongues, and I'm in the back, and I start speaking in tongues with George Kimber. <laughs> the guy that puts you in the devotional. Yes. <laughs> I begin to go to his prayer meetings, and that's where the prayer began in my life. Really? I caught the fire of corporate prayer from George Kimber, and that began to be now, the Now, was, was he a professor? He was a professor of Bible college, but he was a pastor in a little brethren in Christ church. And he met you in the in the lineup he at the met cafeteria. Me in the line, and I was drawn in to the spirit of revival in those days. So that shows you what a father can do. Absolutely. I I have found him many years later, thanking him for what he gave to me. Affected the globe. Yeah. One man <laughs> who drew my heart out and loved me just the way I was. And um, that kind of was the story of that season. And I lived in revival. So how long did you stay there in this, uh, I, uh, when you went back? About a year and a half. And I was going to this revival, this revival church. And I was talking about going to seminary because I thought that's what preachers do. And, uh, uh, and one day they put a surprise this, I was living in a man's house. He said, I want you, we, there's a meeting tonight in the basement of the church. We want you to come. I'd been talking with him about going to Ashland Theological Seminary mm -hmm. in, in Ohio. And, um, and he, I come into the basement, and all the people like, oh, from the church are there. And they've got a huge money tree to send me to seminary. Really? Yeah. And I go to seminary in Ashland, Ohio, and I have no idea how God is going to lead me from Ashland, Ohio, into the greatest journey of my life. So did you actually go to seminary? I went to seminary, and uh, I went to seminary, and for two years, I, I was a, a Methodist youth pastor. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> I, I was so messed up, but so fiery, you know. <laughs> And I remember one time preaching to all the, I had 70 kids in my youth group and 
preaching to him and I was oh I was on fire but I was also messed up and I said you think this Christian life is easy well hell no it is <laughs> it, but but then I but I was I just didn't have any character mm. but I was fiery for God <laughs> and I told the kids don't go to the Methodist church anymore I told them to go this is really bad to the assembly of God down the church and you were the Methodist youth pastor I was pastor. the Methodist youth pastor <laughs> I literally went back to that Methodist church just a few months ago because I wanted to find that pastor to ask his forgiveness because they fired me for doing this. <laughs> and um, I, I, he wasn't there, but another pastor, I asked his forgiveness, a Methodist. But I ended up with one student, they fired me. I did with, she was the valedictorian and preached the gospel to the whole school. They literally would bring me into that high school to, to assemblies and I preach revival to the public school wow. of a thousand students. They called me the Billy Graham of Ashland, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what happened. Seminary, I just didn't get it all that much, but I, I loved, I was playing tennis at the time and God just drew my affections and my hunger for sports just died away. I got hungry for revival. And I met a young man who was in high school and a, a school teacher there in public school. And God knit our hearts together, the three of us, and we made a covenant to seek Acts chapter 2. Wow. No matter what it would cost us. Little did I realize that would become a costly thing. But it was in those days a mini Jesus movement revival broke out after I was fired. Uh, and kids just started getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and baptizing them in the ocean. Where was this? Uh, in Ashton, Ohio. I remember uh, uh, preaching in a movie theater. I was sitting in this movie theater, and this movie was called, Oh God, you might even yeah. remember George Burns. <laughs> okay. It was kind of a mockery, yeah, a stupid yeah. comic. And I'm listening to this. I'm by myself, two years old in the Lord, and I'm sitting there, and the the Holy Spirit speaks to me, Lute, stand up and tell them I don't need this kind of help. If they want to know the true God, turn to Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking, no! A full movie theater? Full, it wasn't full, but lots of people there. And I'm thinking, I, I, I'm losing it. But the more I sat, the more the fire burned. <laughs> and the next thing... I am preaching in that movie theater. While the theater's going, yeah. the movie's going if you, on. Yeah, if you want to know the true God, turn to Jesus Christ. I run out of the movie theater <laughs> weeping, crying like a bawling. I'm, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> the next day, this young man that now I was living with, a householder, a household, he came to me and says, you wouldn't believe this guy came up this morning. And he said, hey, I was in a movie theater last night, and this wild man stood up and began to preach. <laughs> And, and, and I said, I was that guy. <laughs> Those are revival days and ended up the Lord led us by the Holy Spirit to go to Maryland where there was an outpouring, a movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, now just a sec, before, so that was only two years into your salvation. Really, it was probably two, three years now. Two and three. Into my salvation. A Jesus movement was going on. An Episcopalian pastor opened his church every night for us three to go in there and pray for revival. Charismatic movements going on. Jesus movement. Kids being filled. Dreams. This is the beginning. So che Cheon says in that period of time, in the, I mean the 68 to 72, there was something like how many million teenagers came to Christ? I think, did he say two, two million? million? Two million. Yeah. See, I got saved in 75. I, 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 I was toward the tail end of it. Yeah. But oh my gosh, they were being baptized. I remember the meetings in the firehouses where kids just 20 years old were leading whole groups of kids. It's just... It was alive in the spirit. Wow. Wow. So you're going to say uh, you went to Maryland? Well, yeah. What happened was, uh, uh, what happened was, it's, it's a long story, but my this young high school guy, Duke Smith, we made this covenant to seek Acts chapter 2, got connected through a, at a Jesus festival, festival with a man that was part of Larry Tom's Acts movement, mm -hmm. C.J. Mahaney, and a movement of 2,000 kids meeting every Tuesday in a gathering called Take and Give. Jesus movement, people being healed. And there was a man named Cheon, Cheon, who was in the healing ministry with them. Blind eyes were seen. 
We went out there, and the first person I met was my wife, Tres really? Clark. Now my wife, she's the first one. It was almost like the Holy Spirit set the whole thing up. And almost instantly, I knew, I, I felt it in my heart, this could be. This could be her. This could be her. And um, I stepped into a remarkable uh, movement of God, and uh, that began uh, my, my, my journey. Wow. Yeah. So you're, you, you moved to Maryland. What did, why did you move to Maryland? Well, what happened was when we were doing the Jesus Movement thing in Ashland, Ohio, um, we realized we were listening to tapes and stuff. We, we didn't have the character. Yeah. We realized that we needed help. And, and so we began to talk with the men in Maryland, Larry Tomzak, a, na- a man named Steve Shank, who ended up discipling me. And they said, why don't you meet us in, uh, in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania? We're driving to Youngstown, Ohio. Why don't you meet us, pick us up in Erie, and we'll talk about this. Maybe you should just come to, for six months to see if this is how God is leading you. So we picked him up in a Cadillac, a doctor let us use his Cadillac. We picked these guys out, Larry Tomzak, Steve Schenk, and there was a man in that car named Cheon. Wow. I had no idea <laughs> that God was setting this thing up. Six of us in a Cadillac, and they said, why don't you come to, Los- uh, to, to Maryland uh, for six months? If it isn't God, you can go back. Yeah. And we went there not knowing what we were going to do. I thought, I told my friends, they're going to raise me up to be a pastor in one year. (laughs) I mowed lawns for five. Five years? Five years I mowed lawns. But it was my seminary. What do you mean you mowed lawns for five years? Yeah, people were telling us, you know, get a career. But I I, I told them I don't, my career is revival. I, 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 I graduated cum laude from college. Went two years to seminary, but all I wanted was revival, and I wasn't going to get a career. So I took up mowing lawns, and I would mow lawns at this place called Leisure World, an old folks home, and I'd mow lawns for eight hours. A day. A day, behind these mowers, and I'd So you just walk and push? Yeah, it was kind of automatic, power mowers, huge. And I would, it was so loud, I'd just pray in tongues for hours. That was my <laughs> prayer seminary. So were you walking or sitting? Walking. So you're walking, well, and they've got a power mower, and you're just walking behind them. Praying in tongues. And you're praying in tongues. I could pray. I prayed for hours. This became my, my seminary. <laughs> I would pray for revival. <laughs> <laughs> for five years. Five years. I mowed lawns. I, I got married, and uh, I, I, I got married, and then... Uh, and then I, I lost my job or something happened and I was out of work and I was newly, uh, and I was going to get married and I was really didn't know what to do. So I started working temporary jobs. I, I was dipping, uh, like <laughs> solar panels into the acid all day long. I'm a visionary and I'm dropping <laughs> solar panels <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm, I'm just try, I'm, I'm going crazy. And I'm looking for other jobs and I'm panicking because I'm getting married in just a month or two. And I, I and uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to me, says, stop. I want you to lay all of it down. Don't work for three days. And I want you to seek me for three days. And then I want you to look at the newspaper. So for three days, I just waited and just prayed and just said, I'm not going to be anxious. I'm going to trust in you. Holy Spirit says, look at the newspaper. I open up the newspaper where you, the ads, lawn maintenance foreman in apartment complex, the address, it's right next door to the apartment I'm just buying, getting right now that my wife and I are going to move into. It is literally (laughs) yards away. I walk across the street, get the job. I get married, and I can be with my wife at lunchtime every day. It was a kiss. This is the five years of mowing lawns. This is the second. This is the the two years, my uh, three years at Leisure World. We call it Seizure World. It was kind of bad that people would die all the time. <laughs> but Seizure <laughs> World. <laughs> you probably take that off the tape. But but. Uh, and I would wait five days a week, and my wife would work two days a week as a nurse, make more than I would make in uh, with mowing lawns for five days. So, how old were you when you got married? I got married when I was uh, 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 twenty-eight. 
28. And she was 24 or 23. And um, that was my bride. And it was in it was in those days. I was sweeping in the basement of an apartment complex with a mask on my because red dust. I'm in the bottom of the floor with red dust everywhere. Here I am. What am I doing with my life? Nobody's going to raise me up. I, 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 all I want is revival. And I'll never forget it. The Holy Spirit spoke to me down there with that red dust in my face. He says, I've called you to be an instrument of revival. The Holy Spirit filled. I began dancing and shouting in the basement of the, of the apartment complex. And I knew that I was being called by God. And you're At 28 now. 28. And Cheon calls me. He said, will you be a part of my evangelism outreach? And I love Che because he always talked about revival. People would be slain in the spirit. And t t tell the listeners why it was that he chose you. Well, in 19, he called me. I was in his, in his class. And one <coughs> night, I'll never forget it. One night, I'll never forget it. He had me stay later. And he said, if you were to be sent to anywhere to plant a church, where would you go? I'd say I'd go to Los Angeles to be with the Hispanics. And he brightened up and he said, Lou, that's why I asked the question. Because in 1982, I had this dream of a black man saying, come to Los Angeles. There's going to be a great revival. And I've had it in my heart to ask you to come with me because I need a praying man. And, and, he, he, and, he, and he prefaced it by saying, any man who would mow lawns for five years so he could be prayed to pray in tongues... <laughs> That's the man I want. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like that. And uh, he took me under his wings. He bought me a suit to prepare for the ministry. <laughs> and 12 of us went out in 1984. And the rest is history. Wow. It's a glorious narrative. 84. How old would you have been then? 31. I think it was 31 or 31 years old. So what really shines through your testimony is... <clears throat> is the is the duration of preparation absolutely like all these young people see lou angle and mike bickle and cheon and all these giants these generals and they're up there and they're ah, fire breathing but they don't know there's like 20 years behind the scenes of tough slugging it out mowing lawns sweeping basements Crying out. Leading cell groups, small groups, taking care of sheep. I remember, uh, I, just, I, I just remember the dog days. Mm. And I had a cell group at, and a church split took place. And I lost my cell group in one day. They all left to go with the prophetic guy that split the church. And you were friends with them all? Oh, they were my best friends. We were revival guys. We so lived together. We shared got, life together. How long were you with them? Years. And they all left you? They all left the church. They wanted to go to the green grass of prophecy. And they and and because I lost it, I was in, in the middle of the church split. I was part of the problem. And I hated the pastors. Well, I didn't hate him, but I just didn't like him. I liked the the guy that split the church, and it, it's a. I, I still I still love him, but it, things were going on that was weren't right, and I was being torn. Do I follow or do I stay in the church? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Some people ask me, "What is the key to your life? An angel visitation, some mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit." The key to my life was I was listening to a preacher from England in that church preaching that God was going to trample the courts of the Gentiles somewhere, something like that in the Book of Revelation or whatever. And the Holy Spirit interpreted it to me, and He says, "I want if you stay on the outside of this church, you will be trampled." Get on the inside and become the best intercessor for the pastors you don't like. Wow. And if the ship sinks, sink with it. 
and I made a decision I was going to be an intercessor for those pastors and stay in the church. It was a month later or so that Che asked me to come be a part of this thing. Had I left for a spirit of prophecy and didn't stay under the discipline of the Holy Spirit's working, I never would have gone and planted a church. Never. I never would have seen the call. The greatest test of my life was to submit to those leaders in my in my life. And stay there. And stay there. And then a month later... Che comes. Because you were there. Yeah. And then I stayed for 10 years with Che. He loved me, brought me up into ministry. I was unknown. People don't understand that the call began at age when I was 47 years old. The call meaning the call ministry? The call ministries. All this other stuff, deep preparation, every increasing spheres... Wow. You know, in my life, praying and fasting, 10 days praying for deliverance and deliverance breaks out, then 30 days praying for a church revival breaks out. <laughs> Little did I know that I would be invited to pray and fast and start a ministry called Pasadena for Christ for a city. Little did I know then that God would lead me to begin to mobilize prayer in Los Angeles. Little did I realize that God would then lead me to do the uh, a fasting and prayer movement with young kids, high schoolers all across America for six years. Little did I know that God would call me to do the call that would touch a nation. Little did I know that after doing that, we would be touching the whole world with united fasting and prayer, sticking it long enough. Wow. Yeah, just stay with the story and don't bail out. Don't get jaded. Just stay in the story. So, so literally... It starts at six. It starts at four. <laughs> Watching Holy Smoke revival meetings, six, and then a comeback at 22. Yes. 22 you were. Yes. And then it was like 18 years of just doing, you know, all the way from mowing lawns and sweeping basements, yeah. dipping solar panels. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it with your uh, uh, stick or no, what? No, we had some kind of deal we had to, you you would put your hand in the acid. So you'd so you have to stick it in with this little kitten thing or whatever. Did you have gloves and stuff? Yeah, yeah. And we'd dip that thing all day long. <laughs> Give me solar panels. Little, I, maybe God was speaking to my, I'm going to give you solar panels in your spirit so you can see the heavenly realm. Oh, I did those jobs too. Oh my gosh. Our stories are remarkable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just, just faithful and then tested, tested, tested like follow the, the green grass, but no, you be an intercessor. And for a pastor, you didn't even care for. I tell you, I, I was fired. <laughs> the pastor said, you're, you're not a pastor. We all know that. So either get a job or go do whatever you're going to do. That's what he told you. Yeah. And and so I did what I was going to do. I started passing in for Christ, not knowing that would that a revival among Taiwanese kids would be the first day I started full time. Little did I know that that would be the beginnings of a movement that would lead to the call. Sometimes firing is a promotion. Yeah, really. Yeah. Say that again. Sometimes getting fired is a promotion. <laughs> Just ask Joseph. That's his journey. I'm not talking to be fired for being stupid or bad character. But God has his ways wow. of getting you into a place where you can fulfill the destination that's on your life. So how old are you now? I just turned 65 on uh, on October 9th with 22,000 women on the mall on my birthday. Really? With a million seven on million... 1,700,000 watch views. We think 3 million views with all the things going around the world, calling women to rise up and wow. pray, take the uh, uh, destiny. That was my birthday, my 65th birthday. Wow. Lance Walmart talks about convergence. Uh, Lou, you're in convergence. Your destiny, your, your abilities, your calling, everything is in convergence. And you're about to call, and you are calling the whole world, <laughs> yeah. the whole world to global prayer and fasting. Take three minutes. Tell us about the atomic bomb, the bomb of, you know, atomic bomb through fasting and prayer. 70 years ago, a man wrote a book called Atomic Power Through Prayer and Fasting, Franklin Hall. <clears throat> 
and thousands across the world were caught up in that book and began to fast and pray. 1946, 47, 48, fasting into the 50s, 47, the healing revivals break out. T.L. Osborne, they were all fasting, reading his book, Atomic this Power to Prayer and Fasting, written in 46. 70 years ago. 70 years ago. We're in a 70-year season. 1948, a group of, uh, of uh, seekers are up in um, North Battleford, Canada, Saskatchewan. And they read the book, Atomic Power Through Prayer and Fasting. He said they didn't even know there was such a thing as extended fasting. They said the grace of fasting rested on them all winter long. And then in January, the latter rain outpouring begins in Canada, sweeps through the world. The latter rain, signs and wonders, prophetic music, angel choirs, words of knowledge. It explodes in 48. They call it the latter rain. 48, Israel becomes a nation. What was going on? A worldwide Joel too fast was taking place, preparing for the restoration of Israel, preparing for the outpourings on the Gentiles. That was 70 years ago, 1948. Bill Bright, 49. Bill Graham, 90. The evangelism, evangelists were being prepared through massive fasting and prayer. We believe 70 years are up right now, and God is dropping an atomic bomb again. And just here in a conference today, the Catholic believers are seeking to call for from the whole Catholic Church to lead us next year, the whole globe, the Catholic Church, into 40 days of fasting during Lent for the great outpourings of the Holy wow. Spirit at the end of the age. John 17, unity in the church. I'm living in a dream that 17 years ago I called a 40-day fast, and now it looks as if the whole world might be swept up in it. Now, 17 years ago, you call the 40-day fast based on the word that Paul Cain gave you. Paul, uh, Paul Cain, uh, Paul, uh, I, uh, a man had asked me if I would help mobilize a 40-day fast for the whole globe going into the new millennium, the year 2000. Nobody knew me at the time. I said, God, if you want me to do this, have Paul Cain, when he's coming to our church, a great prophet, have him call me out and use Ecclesiastes 11.1 as a confirmation that you're, I'm to call the, the globe to 40 days of fasting. He's ministering in a church. He calls me out by my middle name, Dean, hmm. and my birthday. He doesn't know any of this. He doesn't know anything. <laughs> doesn't he know you're there? Uh, no, he doesn't know who it is. I'm in the back. He doesn't even know, know me at the time. And he calls me out, and he says, And I see that you are skinny, for you are fasting. And the Lord says, Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, cast your bread upon the water. And you would ask God to make him prophesy that. That. I, what, what, what happened is I called a fast beginning in, in that beginning of the millennium, headed up toward the first call when the 40, 400,000 would gather to the mall. I don't know who did that fast. I'm sure lots of people did. But I look back. That was 17 years ago, or now 18 years ago. And I was obedient to the word, and I let a little seed fall, and I called for that fast. Little did I realize 17 years later, I now have a voice of influenced by the grace of God that literally I can fulfill that word that Paul Gain gave to me 17 wow. years ago. I am casting my bread so upon the water. Just, just before we end, you have to tell the, the dream of the missing dean, because he said there, there's a missing dean in your life. And years later, this dean comes to you and says, if you could write a message that would be seen by the world, what would it be? What happened? Well, he called me out, Paul Kane, and says, you don't know why you're named Dean, but you, you're you going to know the significance of that name, Dean. A week later, I went to get an honorary doctorate degree at a Bible college. Where? In, in Los Angeles. And, and they gave me the diploma. And she said, look here, the dean hadn't signed his name. And I realized by the spirit, I knew it was about Paul Cain's prophecy. I don't know the significance of the dean. But it was my honorary doctorate degree. Now, 17 years later, Dean Briggs comes into my life. Dean Briggs says to me, 
if you were to preach to 10,000 people and you knew what you preached would lead to the greatest awakening for the worldwide harvest, what would you preach on? Instantly, I began to weep because I knew the Spirit was touching me at the very core of my calling. And I said, I'd call the whole world to 40 days of fasting because before there was ever an original Jesus movement, there was an original Jesus fast. And the prototype son is being driven into the wilderness again to prepare for those to sit in darkness have seen a great light. And those who sit in the valley of the shadow of death, a great light has dawned. Because of that, he and I began to write a book. It's called the Jesus Fast. We were riding in England uh, 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 next to Wembley Stadium. And we were writing a chapter on basically atomic power through prayer and fasting. And the atomic power comes from the concept of the atomic bomb. Yes, atomic bomb. <coughs> what the atomic bomb was to the, another, uh, the natural bomb, so is fasting and uh, extended fasting to natural prayer. Mm. It's ex an extended prayer release of power, multiplied power in extended fasting and prayer. And we were writing this chapter talking about the atomic bomb and we go to a Churchill's place where he ruled in a bunker during the days when London was being bombed by Germany in World War II, the battle for Britain. We're coming back thinking about the atomic power, the prayer and fasting, the bomb, and we get to the hotel and we can't get close to the hotel. It's cordoned off with that yellow ribbon way around Wembley Stadium. We can't even get close to the hotel. And the policeman says, you're not going to your hotel tonight. It's cordoned off. They've just found an atomic bomb, I mean, a, a World War II bomb that is not detonated. You can't get close. You're going to have to stay in a shelter that night. And we're thinking, a World War II undetonated bomb is what we're talking about. This could only be God, but we needed to get to our hotel. You gotta so, go. Gotta go. So we're walking around Wembley Stadium, and Dean Briggs, the Dean that was missing, says, Oh, Lou, I just forgot a dream I had six to seven years ago. And in the dream, I was an engineer that detonated bombs. Oh. <laughs> And in this dream, I ran into this fire and I detonated this undetonated bomb. Literally, there's an undetonated bomb within crash land that could blow off next to our hotel. <laughs> and he says, I detonate a bomb and a mushroom cloud, atomic power, fills the whole sky, the whole world, and suddenly it disappears. And the whole world can see a panoramic vision of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nobody in the whole world that doesn't see it. Wow. They can all see the story of the gospel. And Mike Bickle comes up to him and says, you know what this is? In the dream. In the dream. This is the billion soul harvest that's coming. And, and I'm freaking out when he's telling the story. He says he comes down out of the dream and everybody he talks to is getting saved. Healings are breaking out. He's weeping in the dream. It's the most epic dream he's ever had. And I say to him, do you realize we're writing a book on atomic power through prayer and fasting right now? We are literally, I believe, in this book, dropping a bomb to fill the whole globe with faith, faith for the Jesus fast that will initiate the final Jesus movement. Whoa. We're freaking out. We walk around Wembley Stadium. By the way, he was in an open field in his dream mm. where the bomb was undetonated. Do you know what Wembley means? Mm -hmm. Open field. We oh. want to go to Wembley Stadium oh. and call all of England into the 40-day fast to drop a bomb where the battle for Britain, for the massive harvest of Europe, <laughs> 10,000 Catholics, because I've told the story of my book uh, last year with yeah, your yeah. wife, Stacy, went Hartle. on in 40-day fast, praying that all of Europe will be saved. Something's going on right now. Wow. Finally, we walk around Wembley Stadium and we find a hidden lane. It's called Engineer's Lane. He oh. was an engineer who would uh, detonate the, bomb. the bombs. 
And we went to the engineer lane, and there were police there, and they let us get into the hotel. The whole thing is supernatural. Now, weeks later, some months later, the book has come out, just the first edit. I'm in Southern California. I'm going, I'm watching my son play soccer that morning. I don't want to drive all the way back to Pasadena. I'm going to some church or something to preach that night. So I, I, the Lord forbids me, do not go to that church. Don't go, go to that place. You go tonight, but I want you to get a hotel just for the afternoon. I want you to read the first edit of the Jesus Fast, the book. I'm reading it, and I'm weeping as I read it. It's not about how to fast. It's about the historic moment in which we live, connected to Bill Bright's call and atomic power of global moment, global fasting and prayer. And I, I'm reading this, and suddenly explodes in my spirit. Paul Cain, 17 years before, it said, you don't know the significance of your name, but you'll know the significance of that name, Dean. And suddenly it dawns on me, Dean was the guy that was missing, mm. that's writing this book with me. Wow. And in the writing of the book, we are actually calling forth a 40-day fast for the whole world that we were trying to call back 17 years ago. Wow. But it was only a seed then. 17 years, it's a tree yeah. that's filling the whole earth if you just stick with it. That night, finally, I go to the meeting, and I can't believe it. We pull up. It's the Bible school where I got my honorary doctor that degree. Night. That very <laughs> night, it's the Bible school where I got my honorary doctor degree 17 years ago. And Dean, the dean was not written. He hadn't signed his name. And I realized, oh, my gosh. I had an honorary doctorate degree, but this book has become my doctoral dissertation. It's my calling in life to call the whole globe to fasting and prayer for the greatest harvest at the end of age. It's a supernatural story to create faith. Wow. I'm so happy for God. So here we are, like literally October of the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. October 31st is the 500 year anniversary. We are at Kairos 17, the anniversary of 40 years of the ecumenical charismatic movement that broke out in Kansas. The 50th year. The 50th. Oh, 50th year, 1967, and the 40th year of the Kansas City yeah, Stadium yeah, gathering. Yeah. And and we're here, and just today when we were comparing notes and the Catholic, uh, Catholic theologians here said they're going to call this fast throughout the whole believing Catholic world, the, Ecum the Episcopalians, the Uniteds, the Lutherans that are here, all these different uh, cardinals and leaders and bishops. And we're calling this fast, which we believe is a global fast, which will launch in this window, the 70-year window. And now it's going to release that huge power, atomic power through prayer and fasting for global harvest. The 70th year anniversary of the latter rain, 1948. Yeah. And latter rain and Israel becoming a nation. We believe we're in Daniel 70 into a new stage wow. of history for wow. Israel, a new stage of the outpourings of the Holy Spirit. They're asking the Pope to call the whole Catholic world to the Lenten period leading up to Easter. The Catholics do it worldwide. They fast 40 days. Wow. What if the Gentile world, the, 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 the Protestant world, would join with our Catholics in the 500-year season wow. for a new Reformation outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Wow. It's got to be God. It is God. I, I am not going to be debating about this thing. Sometimes history is is crashing in upon us as you know when the when the cosmic tumblers are falling into place it's not wise to quibble about details that's in the field of dreams come on five, five. a casual approach to the prophetic brings casualties let's move the whole world into united jesus fast for a united jesus movement come on praise the lord so all i can say lou is eight generations ago when those women laid hands on that baby oh my gosh those prayers are still alive yep. they're still alive and eight generations later and in your own kids gloria jesse josiah all your kids are preaching gloria is just a, a rabid fire breathing revival preacher how old is she now she's 22 and i mean i hear her and i want to hear her more than you now absolutely you and me both <laughs> oh well lou thank you so much <clears throat> what's your website uh -huh. Thecall.com. Thecall.com. Check it out. Uh, get everything you can by Lou Angle. Get this, that Jesus fast. Get that Jesus fast. Yeah. 
read it and do it. Do it. Do it. Just do it. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Lou Angle. You know, Wesley, years ago, you did a CD called Extreme Disciples, 1997. When I did it, I thought, this is crazy. This is a bad joke. <laughs> Little did I realize that you taking that initiative, it would blast a sound and a message all over the world. And now you're doing this project. And I got to believe my uncle, Jesse Lady, wrote a book many, many years ago on, on the story of conversions. Yeah, that's what we're doing. That's what I'm saying. It's preparing what I believe the fast is preparing for. Expectation that salvation is going to blow open all over the world. Wesley, you're a pioneer, <laughs> media pioneer, prophet. And I love you. Thank you for making my life a, a big voice. We're by brothers, the grace of God. We're brothers together. Amen. I love you too. I love you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Conversions on the Shiloh Global Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to help us continue to make these great programs, we encourage you to donate at our website, wesleystacycampbell.com. Also, check out Stacy Campbell's Shiloh Company Prophetic Mentorship, where you too can be mentored in the prophetic by Stacy herself. Download our free Shiloh Global app, available on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. On the app, you can hear more programs not listed on the Charisma Podcast Network. Finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes, the Charisma Podcast Network, or wherever you listen to podcasts.